You can count the days since peace in Europe was shattered. Ukraine is on fire. But how do you measure the cost? Where do you start? The tears and fear of those who fled is immeasurable. The Russian people kill us about nothing. The terror and torture of those who stayed mounts with every loss. We know what we are fighting for. Lives from every corner of the world taken. The off-duty Kiwi soldier kills while fighting in Ukraine. Soldiers, civilians, hundreds of thousands of them dead. Entire towns unrecognisable, cities under siege, a nation's future still at stake. Nowhere near over. One year of war, and the cost is already too great to count. There was a time before the war began. Ukrainians flew their flag as a symbol of national unity, not to show what parts of their country they still control. Before February 24th was the day, Invasion Day was for months the cause of international speculation. US President Joe Biden says he's convinced Russia has decided to invade Ukraine. I sense this will happen in the next several days. It sent everyday Ukrainians marching into secluded forests. Are you scared of the Russians? No. No. Where they used what time they had left to train for the inevitable call to duty. Nobody wants war, but we don't have any choice. A dramatic rise in attacks in the country's Russian-backed breakaway territory of Donbass is adding to the fear that Russia will soon invade. The speculation fueled suspicion. Who are you? What are you doing in Ukraine? Do you have a connection to Russia? We've just been stopped by a member of the military. They are so worried about anything to do with the Ukrainian troops getting back to Russia. In late 2021, satellite images revealed new Russian deployments and drills at the border. President Putin was tightening his military grip around Ukraine. 30,000 Russian troops are amassing along this border. Bombing the Ukrainian psyche first, with a show of force on land and in the sky. 150,000 troops had soon encircled the country, but it was still a matter of if Russia would invade, not when. We explored the subway stations as hypothetical solutions to hypothetical attacks. This portion of the floor folds up and creates a wall, and this here would quickly become the best bomb shelter in Kyiv. For all the global fear... Russia maintains a massive invasion force ready to attack. The New Zealand head of foreign affairs has described the standoff as one of the most significant risks to international peace since the end of the Cold War. For all the war-ready messaging... They now require between 1.5 and 2 million civilians who are ready to fight to defend their country. Ukrainians kept a sense of calm, preparation preferred over panic. We have eight-year war in our country. When you have neighbours who all time try to kill you, you'll say, that's why we need to defend. Eight years of war. None of this was new. The conflict had been threatening to escalate ever since Ukraine voted for independence in 1991 and the Soviet Union collapsed. By 2014, Ukrainians were ready for a better relationship with the EU and NATO and ousted their pro-Russian president, Viktor Yanukovych. President Putin, desperate to regain control, annexed the prized peninsula of Crimea for Russia and encouraged a separatist rebellion to seize control of the Donbass region in the Far East as well. Ukraine never stopped fighting to win its land back. The conflict quietly boiled away for years on end. So by 2022, Ukrainians weren't ready to run. 
They were ready to win their independence once and for all. I will fight to a nail. Foreigners, though, hurriedly made exit strategies. What it will be to jump in the car and drive away, potentially never come back, so those are all, yeah. Wow. Stress. As Putin positioned his troops, the world woke up. A parade of European leaders tried to negotiate with him, but the table said it all. US President Joe Biden believes an invasion of Ukraine could happen within the next several days. Putin was in no mood to negotiate, telling the world Ukraine's very statehood was a fiction. In a major power play, Vladimir Putin has ordered Russian troops to enter Ukraine on what he calls a peacekeeping mission. Ukrainians placed their hope in God. They knew what was coming. Any day, any night, any time, I'm ready. And they knew no one was coming to save them. Time did something strange on the 24th of February. It stood still suspended in disbelief. Russia's assault on Ukraine has begun. It rewound to a world we thought was locked in history. It's a full invasion. Troops are now moving in from three sides. Bring your troops back to Russia. It sped up as Ukrainians race to escape Putin's onslaught. Tonight, he's believed to be attempting a surgical strike to take the capital, Kiev. Like an army, like in you see, very scary film, very scary movie. And time moved in slow motion. Is anyone coming? What do we do? Fear gripped faces aged years in a day. 24 hours felt like a lifetime for the millions hiding underground unsure what had just become of their futures. 200,000 soldiers stormed Ukraine in the early hours of the 24th from the north, south and east. Key military infrastructure was hit and helicopters flew over the capital of Kiev, dropping off troops with merciless intent. They are Russian airborne forces. Putin was going to sweep the capital in a matter of days and overthrow the government. Putin chose this war. As Russia advanced, Ukraine emptied. The roads were choked with cars and shock. The journey west took days. More than one million people have now fled from Ukraine. The queue of cars was so long and slow, many opted to walk. This was an exodus. Men of military age, 18 to 60, had to stay and fight. So wives and children sought out safety across the border alone. My father stay in Ukraine. They can't uh, come here. Was that hard? Uh, because now it's war in Ukraine, and uh... <sighs> they arrived in Poland in freezing conditions, without food, without clothes, with only a raw survival instinct. I was afraid for my kids. In Ukraine, train stations were overflowing. The smell is horrific, but the fear is much harder to bear. A halfway hideout for thousands who crammed in for weeks, waiting for a train away from the terror. They ran to squeeze into carriages, innocent childhoods left behind for good. We don't want to leave our home, but we doesn't have another choice. The front line of the war was far surpassing the boundaries of the battlefield. We were witnessing the greatest refugee crisis of the century. Two bombs uh, come down and our house it was shaken like that. The first weeks of war set the tone for the year that would follow. 
The invaders were advertising their violence unashamed. Tanks drove over tops of cars. Others were caught reversing carelessly and firing with precision into apartment blocks. A maternity ward was bombed, the most vulnerable under attack. Russia accused these women of being paid crisis actors. Shelters became second homes. Gunther Roman descended into the catacombs every night with his pregnant wife, preparing to welcome a baby into this wounded world. I'm feeling nervous a little bit and, you know, uh, all the time afraid and I'm panic a little bit even. But a month in and the invasion was not going to plan for Russia. Multiple tanks being pummeled by Ukrainian artillery. Those not destroyed, forced to retreat. Uh, I think that uh, Putin die in his bunker and we will, uh, will dance on his grave. Putin scaled back his ambitions, leaving Kiev and turning his attention to securing control of Donbass. The stories of heroism emerged. Ukraine rallied. We walk here under bomb attack. Zeroing in on glory. They made camouflage nets and Molotov cocktails. Children ran collection points for donated artillery. I would like to fight, of course, but I can't because I'm too small yet. Tanks, hideouts, barricades decorated cities. The only people walking down this main street are carrying weapons, not shopping bags. Soldiers were stationed at every corner, and off duty, they stood among parishioners. Everyone was praying, hoping for the same thing. I hope it's over soon. Yeah, I also hope. Because as the heartbreak continued and the goodbyes mounted, Ukrainians pledged to make all the suffering worth it. They will die on this earth. They were determined to reclaim every metre of their land. Liberation is a word loaded with positivity. Too much, really, for what it looks like in war-torn reality. The Russians were quickly beaten down and out of the north by the underestimated Ukrainian forces. The capital city endured, but its surrounding towns had sacrificed themselves. Burned to a crisp, you could drive for hours and see only a blur of bomb sites. 1,000 people used to work here every day at this bustling warehouse. When the Russian invasion started, most of them moved out of the area for safety. Of course, not everyone had time to escape, or even the option to. And so, with the Russian withdrawal, came the stomach-churning discoveries. In March, Butcher gave the world its first real glimpse at this barbaric war. Bodies of civilians were left decomposing where they fell. Evidence of mass graves and civilian executions emerged every hour, every day. It sparked international condemnation from the most powerful places. The show it happened in Russia. The Prime Minister has called Russia's alleged war crimes beyond reprehensible. And the furthest corners of the world. More than 400 people died in Butcher. Those who survived returned searching for a pulse on their old lives. Russian soldiers uh, live in my uh, house. Sergei's home was a wartime base for soldiers, as Butcher's population was forced underground. Russians stormed the northern area on their way from Belarus to Kiev. Just 20 minutes down the road from Bucha, and you find the lesser known town of Muchtin, a place where it is hard to find a home that hasn't been flattened by war. Luganeva had lived here for 70 years, her house reduced to a pile of pain. 
I'm too old for crying, she told us. But look around and there seems little else you can do. Every month, another atrocity emerged. By September, Putin's men were being forced out of Kharkiv in the east. More than a thousand civilians are said to have been killed there before they left. The outright destruction of people's homes stops you in your tracks when you first see it. But what is most disturbing is just how easy it is to find buildings like these in this area, lives that have been ripped apart. This is what liberation looks like. People returning to their hometowns where they grew up and having to relearn them. They find their schools and churches destroyed. They find grocery stores left in squalor, transformed into Russian camps. They find bones on the roadside outside their neighbors' houses, and they can't find their neighbors. They try to rebuild while navigating goodbye gifts left by retreating soldiers. This land is very dangerous to walk on because of booby traps and mines. In Azum, they make the worst of discoveries. After six months of occupation, torture chambers, mass graves and horror stories are again unveiled in the days following Ukrainian victory here. Потім полуживого повісили. Розумієте? Larissa's brother fought back against the Russians. He was taken, she says, interrogated and beaten for three days, and then they hanged him. Oh, so sad. Ukraine fought relentlessly to claw this land back, and it marked a huge strategic loss for the Russian military. But winners are hard to find. Only ravenous, broken people living in broken towns in what feels a lot like a broken world. For a year, the globe's attention has been tilted towards Ukraine. For some New Zealanders, the gravitational pull to contribute in Ukraine was greater than the risk involved. They fundraise. I've always wanted to get my hands dirty. And delivered food to the hardest hit areas. They started charities, distributing medicine and clothing. Medical, medical That's stuff, all medical. Yeah. Some work to evacuate thousands of vulnerable Ukrainians. Where we're going is hell. Pitched in to rebuild places like Butcher. As soon as I mention that I'm from New Zealand, they're all in shock because they've never met a Kiwi before. Uh, so that's pretty cool. Anthony Connell okay. spearheads yeah. the dangerous process of demining liberated land. My mother tells me it's time to come home. My wife tells me it's time to come home. My kids tell me it's time to come home. The government issued sanctions on Russia, took in refugees. Our defence force has helped to train Ukrainian soldiers. New Zealand and New Zealanders have made a difference in this war. But it is not without cost. The off-duty Kiwi soldier killed while fighting in Ukraine was Corporal Dominic Avalon. He also knew the risks of going there, but still went to fight for them. Our son, Dr Andrew Bagshaw, has died. Two fathers grieving their sons. Two Kiwi men killed in Ukraine. First, we learned of 28-year-old Corporal Dominic Avalon. On leave without pay from the New Zealand Defence Force, he was killed in August after three months of fighting. He didn't tell us he was going to the Ukraine until he was there. He knew we would talk him out of it. The casualty forced the government to reiterate its stance. At no point in time uh, since the conflict began uh, that any of our personnel had been authorised to enter into Ukraine. 47-year-old Andrew Bagshaw travelled to some of the bloodiest parts of Ukraine. He delivered aid and helped people to safety. Developments tonight in the case of a New Zealand aid worker missing in Ukraine. In January, Bagshaw and his colleague were trying to rescue an elderly woman in Solidar when their car was hit by a shell. When asked whether, whether he will come back, he said, not until it's finished. Andrew was a selfless uh, person. Uh, he took many personal risks and saved many lives. 
We loved him. We are very proud. There has been overwhelming grief for their loss, and there has been immense gratitude for what they did. Ukraine's ambassador to New Zealand has told NewSub Dominic Abelin was a hero. New Zealand's contribution has not gone unnoticed by the Ukrainian people and its government. I would like to thank all of you for what you have already done. But there is still more to do. Despite all the anguish, a journey through Ukraine today is punctuated by a defiance more powerful than it has ever been. The reclaimed town of Irpin, north of Kiev, proclaims hope. A place where the artful work of Banksy disguises the graceless work of artillery. Bullet holes and burnt out vehicles are painted with positivity. Ukrainians are desperate to live in spite of Putin but inevitably, their lives are ruled by the fight against him. Attacks on the energy infrastructure have triggered blackouts in major cities. Still, Ukraine is controlling this war in a way very few anticipated. The Ukrainians, I think, are you know, pipping it at the moment, but it could go either way. The fighting is still as fierce as ever. In the trenches of Bakhmut, the enemy is in throwing distance. And every attempt to claim another metre is a risk. This is the situation on the ground. The yellow represents land that has been reclaimed by Ukrainian forces since the Russian invasion began. The red along the east is still under Russian control. This includes five cities, such as Mariupol, where communication and access has been cut off since March. These four regions, Donetsk, Luhansk, Kherson, and Zaporizhia, were declared annexed by Russia in September. Russia no longer has full control of any of the four regions. The Ukrainians have probably taken back between a quarter and a third of what the Russians had initially captured. Um, and they're doing it in, in, in bite-sized chunks. And it's important that they do it in bite-sized chunks because not only do they need to be able to um, take the land back and push the Russians off it, but they then need to be able to secure it. They then need to be able to bring the resources in for the local population again so that, uh, because a lot of their infrastructure has been uh, absolutely destroyed, so the local population can begin to survive. And then they use that as a staging post to take uh, another chunk back. The cost of this war has surpassed comprehension. In dollars and cents, it is well into the hundreds of billions. The refugee crisis has impacted over six million Ukrainians. And while the human loss is a game of educated estimates, the estimate is gut-wrenching. We're talking about a million. And that's not counting the, the civilian population. The, 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 the casualty figures are huge. The war is now back in the freezing conditions it started in, but so much here has changed. Death has swept the country, homes and futures have been destroyed, millions have left. You could say that the Ukrainian spirit has endured, it has survived, but it hasn't just survived, it has strengthened. The Ukrainian forces are currently holding their invaders in place, stalling while troops are trained on the new equipment that has been donated by the West. Russia, though, is desperate to attack before the Ukrainians can deploy their new equipment and is threatening a spring counteroffensive. This will be going on through the rest of 2023 into 2024 um, and could go on beyond that. Vladimir Putin wants this to become um, a long operation. He wants to delay it as much as possible because he knows that elements of the international community are suffering from Ukraine fatigue. And, and he wants to build on that. He knows that's the only way that he's got any hope of doing anything. As domestic issues mount in countries around the world, Putin is banking on the international community growing tired of this war. But Ukraine is a country of 44 million exhausted people. And the past year has proven what is possible when you stand united and what's at stake if you fall.